All right. Good morning. Good morning. So we just sang that song, Death Was Arrested. Just make sure we understand. <laughs> the power of death over our eternal life was completely arrested at the cross. The blood of Christ delivers us. <clears throat> Nowhere in there does it promise that we're not going to suffer physical death in this life. We call that the first death. So those are some examples, <clears throat> once again, sorry, of why we have such a strong need to be in a connected, committed, faithful relationship with Christ, because we just never know when our time is up, our time is up. Okay, but that's a pre-sermon. We're going to talk about um, a couple of announcements. First off, next week, we're doing our annual Church in the Park. It's over at Camelin Park. If you don't know exactly where that is, get on the freeway, go towards Spokane Street, whichever way that is for you, go south towards the river. As soon as you cross the bridge, there's that band structure on the right. And that's where we're going to be So next week. And we're going to make sure we need food. So you don't want to be there and be hungry. Make sure you bring food. We'd love for people in the park to say, what are you guys doing? And we can say, come on over, join us for potluck, right? So even if they didn't bring food, let's make sure we have enough for anybody and everybody who shows up. So sign-up sheets are out there. Um, it's 10 o'clock in the morning is when we're going to get started or when you're going to get started. I'll be much earlier than that. Okay, this Wednesday also is our uh, first return of Wednesdays at the Orchard for grades uh, uh, first through fifth. And so Kimberly and all the stuff that happens back there on Wednesdays at the Orchard resumes. They're going to do a great study on the full armor of God this, this year. So get your kids ready for that if you have kids that age. Also, we have uh, a new women's midweek Bible study happening here on Wednesdays, 6 to 8 p.m. over at the center. Um, and it starts September 7th, so, um, and, and also, let's see, we have men's breakfast, so men, men, don't forget men's breakfast, we got bacon, we got food, we got fellowship, come this coming Saturday for men's breakfast, and other than that, if I haven't said it, it's probably in the bulletin, make sure you check the bulletins, check your app, check the calendar on the app, we've got a lot of uh, things going on, and before we actually transition to the sermon, Let's recognize that once uh, church in the park is over, so this will kind of be the last time we meet in this building until that's done, we're going back to the two services. Summer is over. We're going back to that old schedule of 8.30 and 10.30 services. So if you're a first service person, come 8.30 on the 18th. And if you're a second service person, come 10.30 on the 18th. Did I miss anything? Everybody quiet. Oh, yeah, yeah I missed something. Tanya. No encounter worship yet yeah, because it's Labor Day weekend. Oh, it is. Well, we're not perfect. Um, and so we've got uh, no encounter worship because it's Labor Day weekend. We didn't want to have you to worry about that too much. But thank you for being in church on Labor Day weekend. It's great to have you here. And uh, now we're headed towards fall. All right, so we are in the book of Hebrews. As you probably know, if you've been here any length of time in the last six months, we are going through verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. We're looking at this incredible book. And I, you know, have started to, in my mind anyway, and a couple of times reference here, start calling it the book of Jesus, because virtually every paragraph in the book is intended to point us to the understanding and the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, and even more importantly for us, how significant and impactful it is that Christ did all of those things that the first 10 chapters are talking about that he is our high priest. He, he went into the most holy place, the sanctuary in heaven, with his own blood, and he sacrificed himself and gave that blood as a payment or pro propitiation for our sins so that we can have eternal life. We can be with him. And it's all predicated on us responding to faith, coming to him and saying, I want to hear his voice, I want to respond in faith, and I want to walk with him the, all the days of my life so that I, too, can eternal, inherit the eternal life that he has purchased for us. Okay? That kind of gets us a quick, big summary into the book of Hebrews up to chapter 10. And I think this is Paul's greatest summary of who Jesus Christ is. In fact, I don't know that there's, there's any other book, any other author that can tell us more than, than Paul has done here in the first 10 chapters of who Jesus Christ is, why it's so significant, and then he goes on from this point to tell us really what's the application point? What are we supposed to do with all of this? And we're going to talk about that again this morning. So if you've been hanging with us for six months or whatever since we started this study, 
And you say, well, I need some more application. We're, we're right here at that application point that Paul has been driving to, and that is to understand what we are called by the Spirit, called by the Father in heaven to do in relationship to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? And so I need, what we want to do is back up a little bit in our study, if you're like, I know exactly where we are. We're in chapter 10, but I want to back up to verse 19, because there's a lot of connected points here in Hebrews 10, 19 through the end of the book, uh, through the end of the chapter, verse 39. Lots of connected points here. And we would have covered this, you know, if we had church for three hours or four hours, we could have done this all in one shot. But we had to kind of break it up, because I know most of us don't want to be here until after lunch. So let me read through Hebrews 10, 19 through 30, 38, so that we get the sense of where Paul is driving to. Again, this is application. This is what we are called to do with the greatest declaration of who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us that you'll find anywhere in Scripture. So, that said, verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of the faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see that day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Consider that anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people." It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you, uh, uh, partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Okay. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and he will not tarry. But now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now, this is the application. This is what he's calling us to do. I want you to look at then the parts that we've kind of looked at so far. Because of everything that we have been presented in the book of Hebrews, have boldness to enter the holiest place by the blood of Jesus Christ. He will cleanse us, he will sanctify us, he will wash us clean, and we are called to not just hopefully come in and say, I, I hope God will let me in. It's boldly come because you understand and accept and receive what Christ has done for us in his blood, in his perfect sacrifice. We are called to come boldly. Okay? And then he moves on and says, now, don't forget to continue to assemble one with another because Every one of us will go through seasons where our faith needs reinforcement by the others that we're involved in. And we need to serve others, and we can't do that unless we are in relationship to one another. Okay? Because there is this incredible declaration that God will judge his people if they have abandoned him, 
if they've trampled him underfoot, if they have counted the blood of the covenant like a common thing and insulted the Holy Spirit who called us by his word through his grace. And the writer knows this. Paul knows this possibility exists because of what we looked at last week. There's incredible opportunities for Satan and all the world to come against us with trials and tribulations and all of these things that will challenge our faith. We're called to hold firm in the middle of all of that. Okay. And that brings us to where the section is today, where we're talking about, he says, therefore you, you and I, all of us, have need of endurance, working through. We have need of endurance, for the reason is, so that after we have done God's will, we can inherit the promise. If we stop short of the finish line, what are you asking God to do? Give you eternal life, even though you've walked away and abandoned him and Faith, And we're not talking about sin and backsliding those things that every single Christian does. We're talking about saying, I no longer believe, I no longer receive, Christ is my Savior. It says, God can't give you his promise if you are not enduring in the faith. Okay. So, what that brings us to is what I think is the greatest theological declaration in either or both the Old and New Testaments. That's a big, bold statement. This is one you really, really, really want to make sure you know and understand. Quoting from Habakkuk 2.4, he says, you know, in the short, short form, the just shall live by faith. I'm not the only one who thinks that. If you recall, if you have church history in mind, Martin Luther used that to radically transform his thinking about how salvation comes to us and the entire Protestant Reformation was spawned out of that, his understanding of this one verse from Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. And Paul quotes it, that same verse, three times in the New Testament. Now, let's unpack it for just a moment. What does it mean? The just. That's a legal definition or declaration that God says, I will justify, I will declare as innocent someone who I have chosen based on their condition of faith. I will legally let them off the hook because Christ went into the Holy of Holies with his own blood and he offered himself as a payment for my sins and your sins. And so God says, I will justify anyone who has this blood covering of Christ's sacrifice, but how do I do it? The just, he says, I will justify those who live by faith. Now, what does it mean to live? I really want you to think about this. Does living mean a one-time decision? Or does it mean living? When you say, I'm living for something, I'm living to serve my church, I'm living to serve my family, I, you know, my life is enveloped in my work or my career or whatever. We're not saying a moment, little snapshot in time. We're talking about a life. We are living. He will justify those who are living by one most essential condition for life, faith. I want you to really start to process that. God will justify those who live their life by faith. They make their choices. They make their decisions. They look at God and his promises, and they live by faith. Now, those of you who know the book of Hebrews know that as soon as this chapter closes, we're going to go into what we refer to as the hall of faith where we're going to look at Old Testament example after Old Testament example of those who lived out this phrase for us to know and learn from. The just shall live by faith. Okay. So it's important. I want to actually walk you through a little bit here in um, Habakkuk. We've talked about it. Let me set the stage. Habakkuk is a really challenging book. If you haven't read it, it's only three chapters. If you haven't read Habakkuk in a while... Let me encourage you to read it, but let me also let you know it's challenging. Sometimes Habakkuk is speaking, and then it immediately transitions to God speaking, and it never tells you, thus saith the Lord, in response to Habakkuk. You've got to go, wait a minute, what's going on here? It's a challenging book to read. But let me give you a little bit of a quick summary here of what was going on in Habakkuk's life. Habakkuk is looking around and going, my people are suffering. My people seem to be under persecution. 
They're God's people. He's a, he's, a, he's a Jew. And so he's saying, God's people, my people that I am associated with, are suffering greatly. And he decides, as a prophet, to utter his kind of concerns about the suffering his people are going through to God. Okay, he said, God, I want you to know my people are suffering, as if God doesn't already know. And the response he gets is exact opposite of what he was interceding and pleading for through prayer. Let's read Habakkuk 1 through 3. He says, this is the burden. Immediately the, the prophet opens up. This is the burden that I had to lay before the Lord. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Look among the nations. Watch and be... Oh, this is now... This is where God starts to respond. So did you see what Habakkuk said? My people... Your people are suffering from violence. There's no justice. We are being poorly, poorly treated. And I've been crying out to you, Lord, and you're not seeming to respond. Here's the Lord's response. I don't think it brought the, the intention that Habakkuk was calling for. Habakkuk 1.5. The Lord says to him, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. For I will, will work a work in your days which you would not believe, even though it were told to you. Okay. Then we're going to jump forward into chapter 2 and see how he's really responding here. Okay. Then the Lord, this is Habakkuk 2.2, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write a vision and make it plain on tablets. Tablets, something permanent. Okay. Write the vision on tablets that he may run when he reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Now what I didn't read here is a conversation where the Lord actually responds to Habakkuk and says, You know what's going to happen, Habakkuk? Your people are oppressed. Your people are truly suffering just as you've said they are. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the nation of Babylon, and they're going to come and bring even more wickedness, even more pain and destruction and persecution against your people. And Habakkuk says, What? Are you kidding me? Lord, am I actually hearing these words come from you? Are you kidding me? Do you have any idea how wicked Babylon is? They are way worse than us. We're here. They're here when it comes to wickedness. And God says, yeah, you've got that exactly right. I'm going to use a a, a, a nation which is far more wicked and sinful than you are because you're a sinful nation, and I'm going to use them to judge you. And after I get done using them to judge you for your wickedness, I'll judge them too. Okay? This is the response he gets. He's like, I don't know how to respond. I, I prayed for the Lord's help, and he says instead of getting help, we're going to get judged by a nation that has no righteousness. Makes no sense. But in the middle of all of that, the Lord gives him his action plan. The Lord gives him his application for his life. Don't look around you. Don't look at the circumstances that you are witnessing and evil deeds that are happening in the world. Habakkuk, your charge and the charge for your people is one thing and one thing only. If you want to be justified by me, you will live by faith. No, not living when you give me good things, Lord, I will give you my heart. Not when you protect me from my enemies, I'll decide to choose to live for you. No, he says, in the middle of what the worst pain, suffering, persecution, and torment you can imagine, 
if you will live by faith, my promise for the end of all things is to justify you, is to bring you into eternal life. That's the book of Habakkuk. He was hoping for God to immediately come and resolve their earthly issues and struggles. And God says, no, I'm going to make them worse because you deserve it, even though the people I'm going to use to judge you also deserve it. But here's the nugget of truth that every Old Testament believer needed to know and every New Testament believer needs to know, that the just shall live by faith. That's it. If we can learn that, if we can understand and apply that in our lives, we have mastery over Old and New Testament. Mastery. You can ask yourself. Here, here's the question. People will come up to you. If you're, if you're a Christian and you try to witness to people, some people will say, well, how did people in the Old Testament get saved? What's your response? God says the just shall live by faith. People will say, well, what about people who have never heard of Jesus living off in some... You respond, God says the just shall live by faith. And it answers every single question. How were Old Testament people possibly saved? The just were living by faith. And then he goes on immediately in chapter one, or chapter 11, and he says, how was, how was Abel saved? He was murdered by his brother. How was he saved? Because he lived by faith. How was Enoch saved? Because he was lived by faith. How was Noah saved? He lived by faith. How was Abraham saved? He lived by faith. We get it. God says, I will justify all those who live by faith. <clears throat> now that faith has to be properly placed, it has to be placed in Jesus Christ. Old Testament people couldn't know his name, but now that it's been revealed, every person from Adam to us and beyond is saved by faith and saved by the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we've been looking at in this Testament. And so it's from there that our author Paul uses this verse from Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith, as a central component to his three most theological writings, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. Romans, it starts off in chapter 1. In fact, if you were here in November, we actually went through this a little bit, but we're going to go through it again because it's a while, quite a while since we've been in November. So, Romans 1, Paul says... This is what I've always referred to this as his thesis statement for the whole book of Romans. Book of Romans is written to a people to know and understand why do I need to have faith in Jesus Christ? What does it mean? And he writes this book and he says, look, here's what I want you to understand. He says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. This is the thesis statement of the book of Romans. The just shall live by faith. And then it goes on to explain how important it is that God will bring justification to those who live by faith. It's important. If you understand that, you'll understand the book of Romans far better. The second one, Galatians 3, 10 and 11, it's right in the center. I love how Romans, earlier in our New Testament, chapter 1, he uses the phrase. In Galatians, it's kind of right in the middle of a six-chapter book, chapter 3, he says, the just shall live by faith. And then in Hebrews, at the end, chapter 10, he says, the just shall live by faith. Here's Galatians. He's coming against these false teachings that have crept into the churches of Galatia, that they need to obey the law to be saved. Okay? And he says, no, no. Obeying the law gets you no salvation. What gets you salvation is faith in Jesus Christ. So he says this in Galatians 3.10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one... 
But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. If you want to be justified, it's by faith, and you live by it. But the man who does the works of the law is required by the law to do them, to live by them, and that's not faith, and that doesn't save, Paul says. And then we get to Hebrews, okay? And this is the point, living by faith. The book of Hebrews is a challenge and an exhortation to live our lives by faith. If you haven't caught it so far, Romans is a theological de- description of how God actually accomplishes justification. The book of Galatians is telling you how not to mix Old Testament law with New Testament understanding of by salvation is by faith through grace. You live by faith. And then Hebrews is what to do. You've made a confession of faith. You've decided not to let the law dictate your relationship to God, but you've decided to let faith do it. Then he says in Hebrews, this is what every faithful person does. We live by faith. So in that, he says this, do not cast away your confidence. Don't cast it away. Your confidence can only come from faith in Jesus Christ, confidence for your eternal life. So Paul, uh, in in making that great declaration, says that Christ is our one and only true, perfect, once-for-all sacrifice. We've got to have that, or we're not getting into eternal life. Now, here's the point I want you to see here. The word confidence, it says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence because it has great reward, verse 35. It's the same Greek word that was used as boldness in verse 19. Okay, let me, for if you can look in your Bibles or we can talk about it for a second. Verse 19 that started this whole section off, he said this, therefore, because of everything he wrote for the first nine and a half chapters through chapter 10, he says, therefore, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, right? Boldness, and then after all he said about, wait a minute, persecutions are coming, wait a minute, you got to make sure you're in the fellowship so you don't lose this. Then he says, okay, therefore, do not cast away your boldness. Do not cast away your confidence. It's almost like he's saying there's really only two choices. You either come boldly before the presence of God, you enter boldly into the eternal life that he's purchased for us in his blood, because we know in our hearts and in our minds exactly who Jesus Christ is, and that his sacrifice is more than sufficient for every single sin I've ever committed or ever would commit. Okay? Because of that, I come boldly. But if I cast away that same boldness, what's left? How do I get into heaven if I cast away the boldness that he said purchased my access into eternal life for me? Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, your boldness, because it has a great reward. What is that reward? We've been talking about it all through this book, eternal life. Don't cast away the confidence that Christ has purchased your eternal life for you and for me. Right? So we come in boldness. There's only two choices. Now, God's gracious, and if you're feeling a little less than fully bold, I'm not concerned that you're not saved, okay? But he's really putting it up here as two radical extremes. The challenge, the application, the charge to every believer is to come, use that faith you have to boldly enter in when we reach the end of our life, the end of our days. And he says, don't cast it away, because if you cast away this boldness, this confidence that has great reward, the reward is gone, And the only reward he's talking about is eternal life. There's so many, in my mind, confused commentators out there, when they see this reward, they think they're talking about like crowns in your, or or jewels in your crown of salvation. He's never mentioned anything about sort of like jewels in your crown for, you know, being rewarded for being a faithful servant. The reward he's talking about all through this book is eternal life. Don't cast it away because that's your reward your faith accomplishes the reward that Christ purchased for us. 
So, then it says, the promise is for today, right? The same today. 2,000 years ago, Christ was on a cross. 2,600 years ago, God gave that prophecy that we read to Habakkuk. And he says, in yet a little while, and he who is coming is going to come. It's not about the length of time. For, from God's perspective, who lives outside of time, and a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day, or whatever, it seems like a really short time since he spoke to Habakkuk about the promise that the just shall live by faith. You and I go, wow, 2,000 years, that's many, many, many lifetimes. He says, look, it's a really short time. All I'm asking you to do is live this little, short blip of an existence by faith. And then when you perish and you pass from whatever means happens, accident, natural causes, whatever, when we enter into eternal life, we're living in an eternity that's much wider and longer than my arms can stretch in comparison, our little life on this planet of 100 years or less or so is like this, this little teeny narrow little gap. And he says, now, here's the important thing. When he gets off of his throne, right now, right in chapter 1, he says, the son is seated at the right hand of God the Father, waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. When that time comes, he's coming quickly. Right? We talk about it like in the twinkling of an eye. He's coming quickly when that time comes. It's too late to make a decision. Oh, it's time for me to live for Christ. It's time for me to be justified by living by faith. It's too late when he comes. We have to have our decision ready now to live by faith. Okay? So Jesus Christ, when he does come, he's not going to tarry. He's coming very quickly when that, that all-important day comes. So we have to have our faith in him today. And then this whole chapter concludes with one final warning about apostasy. Get to my notes here. Okay, so there's one final warning here against apostasy. So right in the middle of this, this application, he's telling his readers, look, you have need of endurance. Don't cast away your confidence because when he comes, he's coming quickly. God says, right? So the promise is coming. The promise of eternal life is coming. When he comes, he will not tarry, but the instructions for life for every human being for all time is the just shall live by faith. But notice how it closes out. But if anyone, I think that includes anyone, if anyone draws back God says, my soul has no pleasure in him. Okay. And then Paul goes on to say, but wait a minute, you don't have to be in that group. You don't have to be in the group that draws back to perdition, he says, but you can be in the group and remain in the group that has faith until the saving of our souls. Okay. Now, this is interesting to me. Again, some like, you know, dichotomies here, some two choices. I thought about Matthew 3, where the father speaks of his son, and he says, in, in him I am well pleased. Right? Father is speaking from heaven and says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. That's the positive. God's heart is well pleased with his son. That's a lot of pleasure. Wouldn't you think that the father, in looking at the perfection of his son, who came to do all that God had prepared for him to do, and he did it perfectly, he did it without sin, he accomplished salvation for billions of souls on the planet. God says, well, this is my beloved son, in him I am well pleased. It's the exact same word except for in Hebrews 10, it's the negative. God says, if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. If, so, however high level of pleasure you think God has in his son, reverse it and say, God says, my soul has no pleasure in someone who draws back from faith. Do you see the difference? However much pleasure God has in his son seems to be the exact opposite amount of lack of pleasure that he has in those who draw back, deny the faith, and refuse to walk in faith. So those who draw back can only expect that same judgment that we just looked at a few verses earlier. Right? If someone draws back 
It says they trample the Son of God underfoot. They count the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, as though it's just a common thing. And they insult the Spirit of grace who offered them the truth of salvation through God's word. And what, ha- what does he say in that verse, in that, that section right there? It says that God will judge his people. And it says that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Are we getting the warning? Are we getting the warning that we're called to live by faith? And it doesn't matter to God and your eternal life. I mean, he certainly cares greatly about you. But if the persecutions are coming, if you're saying, but Lord, what about the disease? What about my children? What about my spouse? What about my job? What about all these things? If you really love me, these things wouldn't be a problem. Is that God's response? Or is God's response, the just shall live by faith? There's plenty of scriptures that talk about how these trials, tribulations, and persecutions are there to build up our character. They're there to be an actual testing of our faith. We're called to live by faith. That's the challenge. That's the call. And one of the greatest things we get, because we don't want to go into that destruction, that perdition, which means ruin or eternal judgment. We don't want to go into that. We're called to live by faith. Now, in the middle of all of this, which doesn't seem like a particularly popular message, right, in terms of, this is great. God says, no matter what happens, I'm supposed to live by faith. I can't accuse him of wrongdoing. I can't accuse him of not caring and not loving me. It says, I'm called to live by faith, okay? But then we talked about it today. This is an application passage. So as I mentioned, we immediately transition, not next week because we'll be at Camelon Park, but when we get back, we're going to start walking through Hebrews chapter 11 and see example after example after example. God strips away kind of the negatives of anything that these people might have done, and he says, these are how you and I, New Testament believers, are to live our life. We're to live our life by faith. He's given us the example again. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Samuel, and the rest of them. All of these guys live by faith always in the midst of trials and persecutions. That's our charge. If we get this, you get the point of Hebrews. Get this. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. God will justify every single soul who chooses to live their life by one overriding, non-compromised position of faith in Him. Faith in His Word, faith in His Son, faith in the salvation that was purchased on a cross 2,000 years ago by His perfect, precious blood. Will you put your faith in Him today? And will you hear His voice today? and walk in that faith all the rest of the days of your life. Les, why don't you finish us off? Wow. It's a lot there. What I want to encourage you and and what I try to do is when God is using, you know, when his servants are speaking, we need to ask ourselves, God, what are you talking to me about? How are you talking to me? What are you saying to me? What shall I do today? What do I need to work on? God is very good at doing that. And uh, it's my assumption that he has, and I, uh, you know, he says, my sheep hear my voice. So I, you're his sheep, you have heard his voice, and uh, you may need clarification. And that's why we have prayer time afterward. So I would, you know, we're going to open this time for prayer, and, and you know, the, sometimes you pray, there are people up front here to be 
that will pray for you. There's people that are sitting right next to you that will pray for you. There's people that you're used to in your prayer circles praying for you. And, uh, but I just want to encourage you how important it is to have a little talk with Jesus. It was just a little talk with Jesus that the thief on the cross, a couple sentences, a little talk with Jesus, and it made the difference between heaven and hell for him. And it still is. It still is. A little talk with Jesus. I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you have full assurance of faith or not. If you don't, I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to talk with you. I had a little talk with Jesus in uh, April 1st, 1977. Changed the trajectory of my life. And I'm very thankful for that. So I don't know what you need to pray about today, but we want you to pray. We want to pray with you about the real things. If you need help, get help. So Lord, thank you that you have spoken to us. I pray that you would, have, that you would help us have the courage the courage to walk in the way that you have called us to, the courage to face the issue, big or small, that you are speaking to us about, the courage to walk by faith. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name. And so the time for prayer is open, and, and as a, a um, uh, benediction, I would say, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Thank you.